If coffee is for closers, the Thunder don't even have a Keurig without SGA and Jalen Williams. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, me member, and inside the thunder.com beat writer, Rylan Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunder Pod. On today's show, we're diving into the Oklahoma City Thunder going on their first three game losing streak of the season. SGA sent back to Oklahoma City for conditioning and Gordon Hayward leaves the game early. It's important to not panic in many situations in life, but especially about a 50-plus win basketball team, especially when the circumstances are as such. It's April 6th, and the Thunder have just gone on their first three-game losing streak of the season. The only two teams in the NBA left who have not gone on a three-game skid is Boston and Minnesota. And the only reason that the Thunder have now joined the list of teams who have lost three-plus games in a row is the fact that they're without SGA and Jalen Williams. Sometimes it can be that simple. Sometimes you can boil this convoluted, complex, beautiful sport into it's a star-driven league and you didn't have your stars. And those stars are who you turn to down the stretch of games. Those stars are who you turn to when the other team goes on a 24-5 to run. Those stars are who you turn to in those moments and you didn't have them for three games and lost all three. No NBA team would be able to to consistently win without their top two go-to scores. You take off the top two duo of any team across the league, they'll be significantly worse. They will suffer the same fate that the Thunder are going through. And as a matter of fact, without those two stars, in two of the three losses, the Thunder played well for 99% of the game against Philadelphia in at least 75% of the game for this game in Indiana. And then we had that third loss where they did give a counter punch in the third, but regardless, that third loss is against the undisputed best team in basketball. So no, the Thunder did not have enough shot creation. They did not have anyone to go stop the bleeding. They had lapses defensively because, oh, by the way, those two top scorers are also highly impactful defensively. So it would be incredibly disingenuous to sit here and tell you for the last four years as this team is rebuilding and constructing a roster about how this is a star-driven league, about how Shea is this superstar who gets it done on both ends, and then act as though Things should just be hunky-dory without the presence of what Shea is. And to tell you that J-Dub is a superstar and then to act outraged whenever the two guys who I've propped up as superstars aren't playing and they're losing to act like that's something out of the blue. What's actually encouraging to an extent is the level at which some of these guys are still playing without their stars, where the drop-off has not been so significant Uh, that you don't believe that things can immediately click back into place. Because they've been hanging around. They hung around in this game. They struggled to get it within 10 points. You know, they got to 10 and then got, you know, got some distance put on and then got back to 10. They did teeter-totter there. That Philadelphia game was extremely winnable on the scoreboard. You just didn't have your closers. You didn't have the straw that stirs the drink of this team in SGA and J-Dub. If SGA is the straw that stirs the drink, J-Dub's the ice cubes that make it worth drinking. 
And so this is who this team is if they didn't have Shea and Jade up. That's not very, you know, shocking. You know, go go try to simulate a season where you don't play Jade up and Shea a single minute and see what your record is at the end of the year. It's not 50 plus wins. That's not relevatory, right? It, it, that's not condemn worthy of anything about this season or projectable. Spoiler alert, yes, if the Thunder don't have Jade and Shea in the postseason, they're out in the first round, don't care their matchup. If Shea and Jade are not playing as close to the apex of this season that they've been, you know, the quality of players that they've been this season, yeah, the Thunder are in up a creek without a paddle in the postseason. So far this year, the Thunder are one and five without Shea, five and five without Jada. This team is not designed and built to succeed without their two top guys. Spoiler alert, no team in the NBA is. No team in the NBA is. Most teams aren't even constructed to handle losing one superstar. Most teams don't have a superstar at all. So again, is it is it you know disappointing to an extent where you were in this heated race and then two of your top guys get hurt after an obs- an obscene run of injury luck? Sure. And is the one seed practically done for all intents and purposes? Probably, mathematically. But does that change the future outlook of what this season can accomplish? Not in the slightest. Not these three games. Now. If they return and they're not who they are, right, and they're they're not who they were before the injuries, then certainly you have a different conversation, and certainly at that point you can hit the panic button. But for the sheer fact that they've lost three games, that's not worthy of the panic button. That's not worthy of anything. That's like walking outside and telling me that the sky is blue. Because while the Thunder had moments to win that Philadelphia game down the stretch. And they could have done a better job of carrying momentum in the third quarter against Boston. And they could have done a better job of of, of keeping pace with the Pacers in this game. There's a reason why at the end of these tight contests, every single time that at least one of those players is healthy, the ball's in their hands and not in these other guys' hands. Those guys are the superstars. Those guys are who you turn to. Look no further than Sunday. Shea by no means has a a, a normal Shea Gilgis Alexander game. No way you can spin it any other way. And yet he hits the biggest shot. And yet he hits the game winner in the garden for a road playoff win over a playoff team. Or a road win over a playoff team. Because that's who you turn to. The clutch shots that Jadabs hit all season long. We have a near 82-game sample size of what this team is, how they're successful, and how they close games. You've taken away the two biggest parts of it. Of course, they're not going to succeed. They're not built to. And that's okay. These guys will go back to uh, roles that benefit them who are still playing once these, you know, once the two stars return. And this team will look the exact same way that they looked a week ago. They looked a month ago. That they've looked for the duration of this season. And I'm not so sure that you can say that if you force these guys to play well hurt. I think that that might, well, I think that it would for sure uh, damage the longevity of this season. So the Thunder are doing all they can to maximize the next two months instead of chasing the next two weeks. And I don't know about you, but I would trade in a three-game losing streak at the beginning of April for the opportunity to play basketball for two more months, for the opportunity to, to watch this team, cover this team, talk about this team for two more months on the court. And the only way you have a chance to do that is to lose these games right now and to be the three seed. In a season in which... You have to keep in perspective of back in October, if I told you this Thunder team on April 6th, all they could be is the three seed. First of all, 
you had tell me to take the thunder colored glasses off and that I was the biggest homer you've ever heard of. Second of all, you wouldn't have believed it. You wouldn't have believed it. The hope of this team was, hey, maybe in the tough and rumble Western Conference, you can make it to a top six seed and not have to worry about the play-in. But even that was a stretch for most people. And yet the Thunder, for all intents and purposes, have locked up the three seed. Mathematically, they haven't locked it up yet, but they're three and a half games up on the Clippers, and they have the tiebreaker over the Clippers, and the Clippers are a very streaky team. For all intents and purposes, the Thunder have locked up the three seed, no worse than that. And they're still a game and a half out of the top seed in the West. So I think you take this. I really do. And you do not hit that panic button. Again, this conversation changes if Shea does return and j does return. And, and in the postseason, that does not look the way it looked a month ago. But the only way to even have a shot of it looking the way it looked a month ago is to, quote-unquote, sacrifice these games this week. And there were still some things to take away from this game, like Josh Giddy uh, and more. We're going to talk about that coming up. We're going to talk about uh, SGA being sent back to Oklahoma City to rehab uh, and what to think after this loss against the Indiana Pacers all coming up. But first, I want to say right now, but our good friends over at eBay Motors, check out eBay Motors today because passion, drive, and patience are the winning formula uh, for the championship, and it's a winning formula for keeping your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level up to peak performance, superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED uh, headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered with 122 million parts to choose from your number one ride or die. It's exactly what you want and what you're looking for with a guaranteed fit. Uh, your part is a guaranteed to fit your ride every time the first time or your money back. Plus, with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need to uh, pick from at the prices you want, it's going to make sure your car is the MVP and bring home the win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusion supply, and eBay's guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers only. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Subscribe for free across all podcasting platforms so you never miss an episode because it's going to be jam-packed wall-to-wall. Monday through Friday, but we're doing a playoff dash, which takes it Monday through Sunday. And in the midst of that playoff dash, once the regular season concludes, you're going to get a podcast every single game day twice. The normal, you know, close to midnight release, a full-blown produced pod. And then in the morning time, around shoot around, you know, whenever you're jonesing for more content, you've already waved through one podcast and you're just amped up for that game of, of the postseason, you're going to get another bonus podcast, a quick hitting 10-ish minute podcast with me and a special guest. It's going to be uh, media members from around, you know, locally. And also uh, we have a great uh, connect around the league with media members. And of course, fellow lockdown hosts as well to get you amped for the game that night. Plus we're going to have our preview extravaganza, uh, which is going to be so much fun planning it right now of who's all in, who's all uh, able to, to make an appearance on the show to preview the playoffs. It's going to be a lot of fun. So subscribe anywhere. Use your podcast from including on YouTube, but SGA sent back to OKC to recondition. You know, you can look at this in a lot of different ways, and I think it comes down to how do you see the glass? Is it half full or half empty? Um, obviously, this clearly rules him, rules him out for the Charlotte Hornets game Sunday. You can't play if you're not in the Queen City, you know. So he's not going to play Sunday. That will at minimum give him eight days off because that, that means the earliest he could return to the floor is against Sacramento on Tuesday. So at minimum, he gets eight days off. And... If you want to be optimistic, it's a good sign that uh, he's going to be back on the court in such an intensive way. Because the way that Mark explained it was it's it's tough on the road whenever you're you're not in control of the facilities, you're not in control of uh, you know what what you're doing uh, to get court time. And Shea needs court time to make sure he does not lose conditioning. 
So the fact that he's at that stage where you want him on the court a ton and not just you know, the here and there pockets where you can find access to a court on the road seems like a good sign from the outside looking in. And the quad injury, really the only thing you can do with a quad contusion is rest it. And eight days is a significant number because you get eight days off here. Then you play a four-game homestand, and you have to imagine if he did return to Tuesday, they would not make him play a back-to-back on Wednesday. So then you get you know eight days off, play a game, two days off, play a game, off day, play a game at minimum, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off. At maximum, you had a sixth day on Saturday because you don't play game one until Sunday. It depends, uh, of course, how the bracket shakes out if they play Saturday or Sunday. But at minimum, you would get all that rest in a short amount of time with the ability to play actual live NBA games to make sure that you can ramp up in time. So it, it sounds promising that he was actually sent home, even though your you know jukebox shock reaction might be the other way. Now, that's just something that you can piece together. You can also piece together uh, whatever you want to. But I, that's what I, I would piece together uh, if I were uh, you. Let's talk about the game, though. Josh Kitty. Really good job in this game uh, overall. Box score messy, uh, but he turned the corner twice and got leverage to seal off uh, Miles Turner at the rim. That was fun. Had a good cut where Isaiah Joe found him. That was fun. He ran the pick and roll well with Kenny Hustle. Uh, hit Lou Dort on that baseline out of bounds play, the skip pass to the corner, which had not been uh, working for them uh, in the sense of, you know, I talked to Josh about this after the last home game about uh, ATOs and sideline of bounds plays, baseline out of bounds plays. And he mentioned that. Uh, one of the strange things has been that this season teams have been working and trying to counter uh, the Thunder's ATO actions uh, and, and kind of set plays in those settings where typically you don't see a team do that. You don't see a team uh, uh, throw out these adjustments to these plays. One of those adjustments that I pointed out that Josh and he agreed with was, uh, you know, that, that I asked Josh if it was true, my, my assumption was how I've been noticing that teams uh, on the baseline are shading their guy defending the ball, shading him to, to, kind of close off the pass to door, that skip bounce past the door. And he said that he noticed the same thing uh, and that that was kind of an accurate assessment of the situation. And that has almost eliminated the play, obviously, because you can't throw a bounce pass through somebody, um, you know, who's defending you on the ball like that at that angle. And the Thunder have found counters off of it, but keeping that same shell has allowed them to uh, make a savvy observation like Josh did that, hey, they're not, this team, Indiana, is not, uh, shading his guy toward Dort. This is going to be open. Dort's in the corner. Boom, hits it. Uh, so that was a little fun little wrinkle that like Indiana did not plan for that as other teams have. So it's it's interesting after he said that about um, you know you wouldn't expect teams to to game plan for it. It kind of raised my eyebrows a bit. Of we from the outside envision sports and and you know football, basketball. We do business sports is like this tactical match, almost militarian. Uh, like oh, everything matters. Uh, they're crunching the film. They're looking at every advantage that they can try to possibly squeeze out. And for someone on the actual inside to say, actually, you know, guys don't really adjust to ATOs. It's now interesting to see the teams that do and the teams that are like on top of it, of, of putting a guy at the rim for that dive play, that dummy cut that they run with Shea on the sidelines, putting guys shaded toward Dort for this uh, blob play, the skip pass to the corner. It's interesting the teams that do that and the teams that don't. And uh, in this game, either it was a lapse or they just don't care. Uh, Indiana did not do it. Uh, the drive and spin finish on Halliburton was awesome. Uh, two and ones in this game and a shoulder bump transition finish. He's using his body more both as a initiator uh, and as gaining leverage points because he's oftentimes matched up with smaller guys than him at his possession. And, you know, he can use it to his advantage to kind of use his body to, to shield the ball and to get uh, access to the rim. 14 points, 12 assists, nine, uh, you know, nine rebounds. Oh, most of the triple double, he got a steal as well. And, you know, the shooting percentages were not, you know, great in the sense of it's not going to be something that you write uh, a book about. But considering the context of like this is what he's doing without the two guys who make life easier. Like it is so much easier to play off of J Dub and Shea than it is to play without them. That is not breaking news, folks. And he's still putting up these numbers and and just the raw sheer ability to score at the rim that has been prevalent since March 1st. Career best stretch of his career. Uh, that is what's the encouraging part is for Josh Giddy long-term. 
That's not Gordon Hayward. Uh, you know, Gordon Hayward in this game actually started out pretty promising, honestly, because he got four shots in the first half alone. In 13 minutes, he got up four shots. The entire game against Boston, he only shot four times. So he was really looking to score. He had a nice behind-the-back move into an elbow pull-up, which got fouled and won. Uh, he had another drive uh, that got him fouled, the trip to the line. So that's where one of the shot attempts isn't technically in the box score, but it what it is in the box score in a way if you look at the free throw attempts, but it's not in the field goal attempt numbers, but it should count as, as four uh, technical shot attempts for, for Gordon Hayward in this context. Uh, but the sad news is, as he was looking more aggressive and looking like he was maybe uh, coming around to the idea of, of picking his spots better offensively, he left the game early with a lower leg soreness. Lower leg soreness in the left leg. I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to play one on TV. I did not stay at a Hilton Garden Inn last night or whatever the hotel is from the old cheesy commercial Holiday Inn Express. I think it's a Holiday Inn Express. I think I just botched that entire thing. Anyway, somebody much older than me can tell me uh, which one's right. But nonetheless, I did not stay in a hotel last night of any kind. So I'm not going to pretend to be a doctor, but a lower leg can't get much lower than the calf except for uh, your ankle. Because then you'd get into foot territory. And if that's what you're into, I'm not going to yuck your yum, but let's stay focused on the leg here. Calf strain into calf soreness. He left the bench and, of course, was ruled out for the rest of the game. He also left the bench against Houston earlier in the month. I don't know if that if this is related to that at all or not, but just as a little aside, he did leave the, the bench early in another game as well. Now, for Hayward, what hurts, you know, what hurts this for Hayward is this is the first time in his life that he's had to be a role player or a rotational player. And he's clearly you know, needing some time to adjust to that and understand how to assimilate to this roster. And now there's only five games left. So if you have to miss any time you know, in the next few games, it really limits your ability to start clicking and gelling before the postseason. And it ties into what we were talking about on Thursday's podcast of you know, they're, you're running out of time uh, to assimilate into the season. So keep an eye on that as the injury report comes out uh, this afternoon, this evening, I should say. Coming up, let's talk Chet Holmgren. Let's talk Lou Dort and more. But first, I want to say right now, about our good friends over at Amazon Fire TV. Check them out today because Fire TV is your destination for sports live games, highlights, and in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV to provide you with millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend of baseball or college uh, basketball, you're going to have uh, and want your Fire TV. Fire TV also recently created a Fire TV channel uh, to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos of your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us here at Locked On, most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis highlights and more. Keep up to date on the latest in the world of sports from March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention the great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on the Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you have not checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me. Learn more by visiting Amazon.com slash Lockdown Fire TV. That's Amazon.com slash Lockdown Fire TV. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast and the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Uh, Chet Holmgren, you know, unreal footwork from him to get to his spots. Here's where you want to see him grow in his first uh, true summer of development of, of being able to uh, hone in on something that he saw in an NBA game. The footwork is there. Like he it just pulls off these, even his misses. You go back and watch a lot of his misses to even get to a spot where you can get a shot off. Took un unbelievable footwork. The next portion of this will be the balance and the polished finishing skills. And when I say strength, people are going to think that I'm, I'm falling into the national media. Like, oh, he's going to put on a billion pounds and be a Giannis type. No, he needs the, the core strength, though, to have that balance and uh, ability to finish at the rim. And I think that, you know, you're going to see that improve. You saw that with J-Dub improve uh, you know, from year one to year two. I think that it'll improve for Chet as well because he has the footwork down. You can get to his spots. It's just kind of staying on balance that, that I think could help him 
down the stretch. Uh, not down the stretch, you know, in the next year of his career. Uh, he also had four fouls in this one. Three of them were offensive. And I just want to point out that that can really flip playoff games and playoff series. He had an illegal screen. He had uh, a driving foul. He was driving in and uh, just kind of swung his elbow a little bit. And they called him for a foul. I didn't love either one of those fouls. Then he had a loose ball foul in the offensive end. And you just have to be cautious if you're Chet Holmgren. The only time he's fouled out in his whole career was via you know a large chunk of offensive fouls as well in Houston, against Houston, I should say, in Oklahoma City. Uh, sometimes, especially like that loose ball, in the playoffs, every possession matters, everything matters. You would rather, you would rather see you let that let that play go to, for the sake of staying in the game as a defensive anchor who's going to get fouls put on him, likely unnecessarily at the rim as a as a defender, so you can't really afford to give them away offensively. Speaking of the, you know fouls and the defensive end, Lou Dort, he drew three illegal screens in this one, and you know, the technique behind it is very interesting. Uh, he's never revealed this. We've asked him; he hasn't revealed it. Uh, but you can see just by studying his his illegal screens drawn, which is a very uh, nerdy thing. I should not admit that I've done attacking the out the outside of the hip uh, of the screener with as much force as he does opens up the screener and it just looks illegal. Sometimes it's not an illegal screen at all until Lou Dort makes it an illegal screen. Then he has that sell job that, that every player does mostly offensively, but you know, you can have a sell job defensively too. Uh, and some of it's not a sell job because some of it is like he did go into a screener such at such force as a grown man on a grown man. that You're going to have that, that kind of uh, spill out where you can get three citations on, on the other team and put four on Miles Turner. I think he drew Miles Turner's fourth foul uh, on one of those legal screens. That's a huge reward for your team because you not only stop the possession, but you put a foul likely on a, an important big man, especially in the playoffs as you go pick and roll heavy with your best big, best guard. Uh, the risky proposition, though, is if you have a crew who's not giving you that call, you've essentially wiped out yourself from the play if the other team wants to play fast enough off that pick and roll action or off that screen action. So you don't want your best defender wiping him out of the play or wiping himself out of the play if he can help it. But you do want him to draw the illegal screen. So it's a delicate balance, and I'm interested to see how it kind of all unfolds in the postseason. Uh, another thing that he did really well, which is just a, if we're going to be nerdy, let's be nerdy. Uh, he kind of had an Iverson cut where he tapped Halliburton on the hip, and you know Halliburton talked about how you're taught as a defender to – move on contact in a certain defensive coverage. If you're, if you're switching everything, uh, it, then that's how you can get confusion on these slip screens and how these slip screens work so well is that it's not a real screen. You're not really going to switch, uh, but you did get hit a little bit and brushed a little bit where you're thinking that it's time to switch. And so uh, sometimes whenever Dort cuts an Iverson cut across the, across the you know arc, he'll tap whoever's defending the ball. And it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's a little bit of a gamesmanship that I think uh, pay, is, there's no harm in not doing it. Uh, 22 points, two rebounds, an assist, 53% from the floor, two for seven from three, two big-time rim finishes, just as a brute strength type of guy, uh, one assist, two boards. You know, a good game from Dort, considering the context of, of everything involved. It was also a good game from Dort just in general, but uh, I think that some of those three-pointers get easier if you have uh, the gravity playing alongside you. Kenneth Williams, 18 points on seven for seven shooting, two for two from three, eight assists. I'm sorry, eight rebounds, three assists. And a block. Kenrich was awesome. Uh, he was just stellar in this game, and he's the MVP of the game uh, for Lockdown Thunder. I thought that with Kenrich Williams, you saw the benefit of him, especially playing the small ball lineups. Um, he is a small ball lineup guy, but you're lacking raw height, but you're not lacking leverage and strength, which I, th which I think that you should like if you're Oklahoma City. And of course, when he's hitting his shots, things are going to look, be looking good. But he had some really nice cuts. He had some really nice uh, uh, screen and roll actions for for his guard. That was really good from him. Lindy Waters. Lindy Waters like is such an interesting player because you know my thoughts on him. I'm not like sold on his NBA potential. It's interesting though that like he has picked up the defensive end way better than you originally thought he ever could at the NBA level. And so it's not the defense that that gives you pause. He's he's also gotten a little bit better with the ball in his hands, at least at the passable level. 
It's the shooting. Like I've been talking about Lindy Waters his entire career. He's a sharpshooter in name only. This guy does not hit threes at a consistent enough rate to warrant uh, the opportunity uh, at the NBA level, but he clearly can shoot the basketball. So what's interesting about Lindy Waters is he's cleared every hurdle that he would need to clear to be an NBA player, like a full-blown multi-year contract rotational player. He's cleared every hurdle. Nobody thought he could defend at an NBA level. He is defending at an NBA level for the last two years. At At a good NBA level, he's defending. The one thing people were banking on was his jump shot, his three-point shot. That's what's been holding him back. And so I think that that in and of itself might explain the trust and the want to to not give up on Lindy Waters from the organization is this was supposed to be the easy part was the the constant knockdown sharpshooting. Uh, The other stuff was going to be the hard part to get him to, to get him up to speed on. He's really gotten all that stuff. And it's really been impressive to watch him grow as an NBA defender. He's just got to become an actual sharpshooter at this point. Can he do it? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, to this point, I'm not encouraged that he can. But again, he came in with a baseline as a shooter that would lead you to to think that he'll be a good shooter in the NBA. So it's interesting. I don't. I don't know. I thought he played solid minutes tonight. It didn't, you know, really matter in the end. Uh, but solid minutes tonight. It's just an interesting aside of like. Here's a guy who no one thought could defend in the NBA that is doing that and that Mark has given him so much credit as an improved defender uh, for good reason. And the only thing holding him back is what we thought was going to be just this perfect skill for him. Anyway, that is the seventh pot of the week and uh, and uh, the Pacers you know, recap for this show. We'll be back to recap the Hornets game as Poku and... Poku was flexing today after a dunk. Watch out for that uh, if you're Oklahoma City on Sunday. We'll be back to recap that game and kick off a very fun week, the final homestand of the regular season, uh, the final games of the regular season, and then it's our postseason extravaganza. A lot of fun. Cannot wait for it. First time really covering the postseason here at Locked on Thunder. So let's have a let's have a year, shall we? Subscribe across all podcasting platforms and on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow me there. And until tomorrow. Be good and be good to one another.